between Baker Skip, this time in construction and mining. Trade ABC looked into the cause and how some say it's related to oil. Inside these gates, you see rows of heavy construction equipment, bulldozers, diggers, water trucks, you name it. They've got just about everything you can think of. Just a few months ago, you wouldn't have seen all of this equipment sitting here in this yard. Employees say it was like a conveyor belt. When it's booming, there's a low bed trucks, there's two trucks, they're just hauling stuff out all the time and bringing stuff in. Today, you can see dried mud on tires in driver's seats sitting empty. Now it's just bring it in, fix it, and then park it. And this is the story all across town. When drilling and pumping slowed, the equipment needed to service them now sits dormant. There's no drilling at all going on right now and uh, very little maintenance. Uh, it's, it's bad. According to data released today by the California Labor Division, more than 3,000 jobs have been lost in Bakersfield from February 2015 to February this year. That was in construction, logging, and mining, something those in the industry say directly links to oil. Vice President of Gilliam and Sons said the oil side of their business is down 70 percent, leaving workers wondering what's next. The guys down the street that are all sitting at home, they look pretty down and out and depressed and worried for sure. On the way to radio show. You just want to use me. Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, come on, Biz. You have two kids and a wife to worry about now. Wouldn't you like to be able to provide for your family? Wait up, wait up, radio. I don't know what you reaching out your hand for. For I shake it, I break it, hit the grave for I fake it. I would not accept payment to hand folk. Over to the devil, knowing Christ is they last hope. Surrounded by a bunch of gustos out of low cash. But I ain't selling my soul on my notepad. What you want me to do? Promote crack? Figured they wouldn't reject the noose if the rope black. So you make one a dealer, make the rest beans. Make one a millionaire, make the rest bleed. Wanna see us hang? Get a few good guys, sit them in a bent coop and make the noose look flat. I can't do it. I know what it feel like trying to fit a rap fantasy into my real life. Got a couple real homies doing real time, trying to eat. Now they being told when it's meal time. Why would I make that appealing to them? Why would I make rap appealing to them? And now you saying I'm the villain because I'm chilling, trying to get this penicillin through them in a message I ain't quitting till it's been delivered to them. I won't support your lie no more. I won't even try no more. If I have to die, oh no, that's how I choose to live. I won't be compromised no more. I can't be victimized no more. I just don't sympathize no more. Cause now I understand. You just want to use me. What you want me to do? Stun on everybody. Body, body, Fake it till I make it in front of on everybody. Make them feel low, cause they don't got what I got. Like they ain't on my level, cause they don't rock what I rock. Tell them that I live a life they should wanna kill for. Still for, that's what you get in new jails built for. That's how you pick and choose who the record deals for. First one to tap dance, do a little hill coat. Trying to use poverty against them Like give them a Ferrari They'll lie for you and then some Throw a dress on, rock press on Help push the same sex laws And disrespect God Heck no, what I look like Trying to impress y'all Homie, y'all either step off Or get stepped on They saying that I talk Like I walk around with Teflon flesh on But Christ, that's a line I'm willing to put my neck on So go on ahead, Philistine Get the guillotine Three racks from a slingshot to make you Timberland Y'all deny the sun Like Michael did Billy Jean But your calendar is still Based off Timothy, right? BC, before Christ, AD, and O Domini, the year of the Lord, right? So you can mock and you can front about the knowledge y'all got, but every time you say the year, you acknowledge my God. My I won't God, support God. your lie no more. Yes, you the I won't even try no more. If I have to die, oh Lord, that's how I choose to live. Hallelujah. I won't be compromised no more. I can't be victimized no more. I just know simple. Time something come back again. Uh. 
Yeah. Your face make me smile. Why you there? So I bend it up. Money are your problem. Who they tell you? Figures spend it up. And equally, you can believe and not blend it up. Now jump on your money and no know say you feel it up. Why you have to spend and you not your best friend it up? Why you have to pray each and every day me send it up? Gospel have to preach and me there have to defend it up. Bounty full blessing coming down from heaven it up. Problem arise for that day so fi men it up. Man I no chicken so me na go mad a hen it up. Soar like a eagle and me wing me extend it up. Man no flip flops and me na go take pen it up. Yo. Left right, left right, left right soldier. Get right, get right, get right poser. Left right, left right, left right soldier. Get right, get right, get right poser. Left right, left right, left right soldier. Get right, get right, get right poser. Left right, left right, left right soldier. Hey, for there, yes. I know we rap like them, but a little different. Like we sounded, we, we sounded like, but very different, like a harmony. I took advice from my daddy and my mama. Neal. They say, boy, this world can be kind of cold, but you create energy depending on what kind of cold. That's cold. Mean to make the most of your situation, but what if your situation was way worse? I'm talking black suits, Paul Barrows, black purses. Way worse. What if we were sleep and thinking we awake and all the material things we've been given were fake? And all the Bentleys, Bugattis, and Basil, they was fake. And that was a fire to cooking places on the plate. And that was a person with a rod, really not seeing. And had his all hooked, homie, like smoking them tea. But then there was a guy who sent his only son, Ian, in to come and rescue women and men from out they see it. Trying to free you from the trap, boy.
front of mine. It's gonna be a good one. Come on. It's a new generation. Of the God's nation. It's a new generation. It's a new generation. Wait a wait a wait a generation. Of the gospel nation. Look great. Kiki. Heavy. You ain't gotta get your weight up Running from your past, so tell your future to wait up I used to want a ball and with pretty ladies I lay up Shooting for the stars, but I was missing my layups My partner said me stay up, but all I do is stay up Late at night I'm up thinking how I can get my pay up And when it came to God, I thought I had to work my way up Learned about his race and now I can never repay up Rescue me from darkness, took me from a heartless, lawless Boy, you just don't know how good my God is I met the Lord and then he hit me to some life gang The stimulating act of Intros. No car picking girls up in the rental. Uh, Flipping tables like Jesus in the temple. No liquor, order me a shell of temple. Uh, Wearing red radio. shoes ain't not easy. Uh, Come through with the matching outfit like the Bee Gees. Yeah. I came from preacher bi weekly. Yeah. I came from preacher bi weekly. Yeah. I came from preacher bi weekly. Yeah. I came from preacher weekly. Yeah. I came from preacher bi weekly. And oh, nine to every show selling out. Change the world until they finally believe me So put your hands together like a Ouija Board for the unsigned hype with no source Top floor at the Fillmore Watching Andy Vinio Couple months later I was dancing in the video We were wildin' out with Pablo on the mini bow. Hopped out, I did a perfect summer song in the O Shit, only word of mouth, no promotion Just a bunch of misfits with love and devotion And my gang is looking focused That's why we lift the glasses to the sky We're open Come on And I laugh at it Oh, you rap, here's the deal Take a stab at it Now there's a bad habit It's common sense, only the hot shit rap Now everybody and they mother wanna pop They raps, come on, dog I work the nine to five You getting high, wasting time In the studio, why? Shorty, read the da 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 You shouldn't rap if you're whack Just cause you have a Cadillac Sell crack doesn't mean you melt tracks Take yourself back Where you came from Your lame slums Your rhymes are weak Go exercise your brain some You can't ride with the big dog Big dog I flip rhymes Firm rock, hit the flex bomb It's real nice, spit fire, living real nice Big contracts, cars, show real ice But when the dough go, car crash, ice melts I remain hot, firm, can't be stopped Y'all cats rapping, ain't saying nothing Keeping it so real and tell them all you frontin' Like you John Blaze or something I come through, both arms be chunkin' That was way before rap St. Thomas, baby, cat, yeah, baby, holla uh, Furnace Your crew, I tell my crew we party all night. I stays dab off the tap rope like Macho Man. Macho if I man. hit your mama with an elbow, then I'm sorry, fam. Y'all better know it. Y'all better know it. Misfits and minor are lions and tigers. In other words, animals, animals, animals. You, you, you. Oh? We all going crazy. I think you should try now. You, you, you. Me? Hands to the sky like I'm vibing a giant. Controlling the crowd like ventriloquist. Many resurrecting if you're not feeling this party. Just beginning. We are not ending it. People say I'm crazy. I'm not defending it. No.
at you. Bitch, I'm coming street, fattest boy, it's a ride loose. Come and catch you on half of the back room. Even sneeze wrong, and the boy's getting at you. I'll take him and him catch you. I'm that dude, so where she is the best. So what's so what's so what's Everywhere she go, boy, it's a bet. Her man buying Hermes, boy, she only Hermes, Hermes. So they gotta have green. Let me sip this tea, cause I'll take her like a bath in the kitchen. That ain't my bitch. Swear by my name. I keep Anybody. You don't went too far, went too far. Change you and make you anything you can make. Remember that you can say, Mac and Rita, then ain't cool. Ecology say that I'm talking fables. They off for 95 degrees and still miss the right angle. Woo! Hey. I had dinner with a murderer. Why? Even with a cane, he's able to save him.
Jesus Christ. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Oh God. I'm a believer. Yeah. I'm a believer. Hear me out. I'm a believer. Yeah. I'm a believer. Yeah. Yeah. I came out my life and I never thought twice. Came out of my heart and I came out of fire. My spirit and I came out of fire. Sunday school lesson was good. Was talking about struggling faith. 
And um, I, I thought maybe I would even piggyback on that. Even earlier this week, I just thought about it. I just love the title that, The Struggling Faith. And it was just talking about Peter. And David already talked about it. But just talking about how his faith was struggling. And God knew who he was, uh, knew uh, about Peter more than Peter knew about himself. And so I just thank God this morning that he's a God that understands us, that yes. when our faith struggles, you know, when we, when we get a little bit weary, God is still God and he encourages us. And so I just praise him this morning. Um, we have a visitor this morning, uh, Brother Kenny feels out, she didn't uh, ask you to speak, but I thought, yeah, if you have anything you'd like to say, we're glad to have you in our midst this morning. Uh, Kenny. Would you like to have something to say? I'm glad to be here. Amen. Stand up. <laughs> glad to be here with you guys. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. I'm glad he's here too. Uh, and Kenny, I mean, this is his first time being here, I know, but he came in, he was listening to the music, he started singing the songs, and that's how we started out with How Great Is Our God. Malik was singing it, but I mean, he was playing it, but then Kenny started singing it, so... Kenny, we're glad that you're here um, this morning with us. And so if you would, just turn with me to the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 21. As we approach uh, Easter, this is the season of uh, Easter. You're going to be seeing a whole bunch of Easter eggs, chocolate bunnies, bunny suits. You, you, you name it, you're going to be seeing it. Green eggs. Blue eggs. We might have some blue eggs or something like that. We might, but it don't have anything to do with the Easter Bunny. Not going to have anything to do with the Easter Bunny. But um, anyway, this is in regards to uh, celebration of Easter, Resurrection Sunday. We're, we're, we're alive today because Christ, Christ is alive, <laughs> and he's alive in us. And so, uh, chapter 21 of Matthew, you have it? Verse 1. And we'll read together. All right? Have it? All right. It says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a great, a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed, crying, said, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Father, we just thank you this morning for your goodness and your mercy, your kindness, your grace. We thank you, O oh God, for how you bless each one of us to be here today how we have a reasonable portion of our health and strength. We just thank you, O oh God, for the mindset to give you praise and to give you honor. And we just thank you for the things that you've done for us and the things that you're going to do. We just thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for everybody that's here. I ask, O oh God, that you would word of my mouth and give me what to say, nothing more, nothing less. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If I were to take for a topic today, I believe I'm going to take it out of the third verse. And it says, if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, the Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send you. So today my topic would be, the Lord has need of you. 
The Lord has need of you. Or in other words, say, the Lord has need of me. Just tell yourself, the Lord has need of me. And we hear people say a lot of times, well, the Lord don't need you. The Lord don't need you. But we know that, you know, he could call a thousand angels or he, the, the rocks could cry out. We, we know that. But he placed us here on planet Earth so he has need of us. Right? He has need of us. So it talks about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, it says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and they were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And I don't know all the details. I really haven't had a chance to just go deep off into this scripture. I've had it preached several times, but as I was just thinking in my mind, Jesus knows all things, know everything about us. It ties into the Sunday school lesson today when Peter thought he knew himself better than Jesus knew him. And Peter said, you know, you can, everybody else around you is going to deny you, but I'm not going to deny you. You know, they can do what they want to do. I'm not going to deny you. But Jesus knew all things. And for him to send out two disciples, and he said, go into the village Bethphage, over against the Mount of Olives. So you're going to find an ass and a coat. You're going to have to find them tied. He knew that they were tied up. And I was thinking this morning, I said, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what's got you tied up today. I don't know. Maybe it's some things that's got you tied up in life. But God has need of you. Yes. He has need of you. And, and people might push you to the side and think you, 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 you're not that much. You know, I don't know. You, It was just a donkey. Well, they said it was an ass. It was a donkey. So I ain't cussing y'all. It was a donkey. It was an ass. <laughs> people might think nothing much about you. But it's not what people think about you. It's really what God thinks about you. Right? It's, it's really what the Lord thinks about you. He said, I know that there's a donkey there's an ass and there's a colt tied in the city, and I want you to loose them. And if any man asks you what you want to do with him, what, what, what you have need of, I mean, why are you loosing them? He said, let them know that I have need of them. People are going to question your ability in life, right? People question your ability in life. They look at you sometime and think, you're really not, who are you? You know, you just... <laughs> You just, you just live around the corner. You just live on Bank Street. Or you just live, who, who do they think they are? But if the Lord has need of you, the Lord can do great things with you. And that's what he desires to do with all of us, is to do great things with us. But the enemy want to make you, or make you keep thinking, you know, I'm tired of, but I got this going on, and this is in my life, and I've done this, and I've done that, and all this different stuff. But I believe today the Lord wants you to know that I have need of you. The Lord has need of you. Everything about you, the Lord can use. And he can take it and change it and make it fit the way he wanted to, the way he wants it to be. <coughs> Just like Peter, going back to our Sunday school lesson. Peter, Peter was, he, he was, he was a pistol as my husband said. <laughs> but the Lord knew that he could use Peter. Peter had this kind of determination. It's like, you're not, you know, you ain't gonna talk against my friend, you know, wasn't he the one that chopped up the, oh, yeah, yeah the, the ear just pulled out a swart, sliced off his ear, and, and, and see, it looked like that just maybe, with this kind of attitude, why would I need you on my team? You two, you know, you you, you jump at the hat, I mean, you, 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 you're angry, you're mad, you, you're this, but Jesus knew that Peter was going to be the one that he gave the keys to. The, the keys to it. So I'm just saying today that it matters not how rough you are or where you came from or how bad you talk or how you talk. If the Lord has need for you, he can fix you up, clean you up, change you, yes, yes. change you and make you be the spokesperson like Peter was. I'm going to give him the keys to the kingdom. And up on Peter, he said, on this rock will I build my church. And the gates of hell should not prevail. This is the same one that denied him three times, right? Denied him three times. 
Now, he's been hanging with Jesus all this time. Jesus has been doing these miracles, performing different things. He's healing the withered hands. He, he's, he's raising uh, Jerry's daughter. I mean, it's a lot of things. He's raised uh, Lazarus from the dead. No doubt Peter had been there the whole nine yards. He's seen it all. But when it came time to put his faith, or, or came time to, 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 do you know Jesus? Do you know this man? The things that's getting ready to happen that just Peter didn't want to be associated with. I don't know him. I don't know him. And people today are denying Christ. Yeah. They're denying him. And those of us that he's called out, I mean, all of us here, you know, it's not the time now to deny Christ. It's not the time to deny that you know who Jesus is. Because we are living in a world where uh, they don't want you to talk about Jesus. They don't want you to talk about anything religious. You go to school, we, we're in college right now. And I mean, there's things incorporated in your textbooks that is just really telling you <laughs> pretty much that you cannot say that this person is gay or this one is that or you can't, you, you know, it's discrimination and you got gender-based, you know, different people. And you just kind of like, but the Lord don't keep us. We would just actually be confused. You look like a girl, but you don't want to be called a girl. You know, it's people that you go to school with that's actually, that actually has a boyfriend, <laughs> But she don't want to be called a girl. Call her a he. It's just, this is the kind of world that we live in. Is that yes. mean? And, and it's vice versa. All this kind of stuff. But the Lord has need of us. And we have to open our mouths. And we have to let people know that, 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 that he's real. And that he changes lives. Because all of us came from somewhere, right? Amen. All of us <laughs> came from somewhere. All of us got a background. All of us at some point was locked down, tied up, right? We was tied up by something. <laughs> we was tied up by something. And so today, I just want to encourage you today, is just whatever that, that you feel like that has you locked up. Maybe it's self-condemnation. Maybe it's a, a, a just, just different things that have you tied up. I want you to know that the Lord has need of you. He can use you to change a generation. That's right. He can use you to change a generation. Sister Lucky talked about, we didn't want to just be a ministry that just we just sitting here and, and, and doing nothing. There's a lot of things out there that we need to do. I want to make a change. I really want to be a part of the change in the community and, and just in people's lives. Not just telling people just to come to church, just come to church and this is what we do. We're just talking. I mean, I want to be active in people's lives, Amen. right? Because people need to know that I might look this way, but... A few years ago, maybe I didn't look this way. I came from somewhere. And I'm not talking about I came from the worst place, but I was a sinner just like everybody else. You know what I'm saying? If the Lord had pronounced judgment on me 20 years ago, or whether I went to the same hell anybody else would have went to. But I ain't planning on going to hell. So I'm just letting you know I ain't planning on going there. <laughs> I'm trying to live the life now so I won't be living paid something later. Pay, yes, that's it, pay for it later. But I'm just saying we have so much to offer. And don't ever say that, you know what, I've done so much that, I, I mean, I, I've sinned so bad. I mean, God will never forgive me. I, I've, I've just done so much. No, the Lord has need of you. He created all of us, right? Amen. He created all of us. And when he created mankind, he said it's good. He said it was good when he created man, it was good. He knew every mistake that you and I were going to make in life. And yet and still, he loved us enough to forgive us to set us free, okay? So we was tied up by things. So he said, if there's anything, if any man say aught unto you, if they say anything to you, he said, you tell them straightway that the Lord has need of them. And verse 6 says, and his disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them <coughs> and brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and they set him thereon, Okay? And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches. That's why they call it Palm Sunday today, when they cut down the branches and they threw the branches down so that the horse could walk through, I mean, the donkey could walk through, and they scattered all these things. It says, The multitude went before him, and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna. And it says, Hosanna is the transliteration of a Hebrew term meaning, meaning, Please save. So we said, Hosanna. They would say, Please save. Please save. And all this that Jesus did, and all the things that they seen Jesus do, 
Later on, some of these same people will be the ones that was that was very vocal in his crucifixion, you know, and all that he done. And so sometimes people see what you do and they still want to tear you down. You know what I'm saying? They, they want to tear you down, beat you up, beat you down. But the Lord has need of you. You have to open your, open your mouth and speak. Say, Lord, give me what to say to people. Because we live in a generation that is people just dying. Day in, day out, they're just dying. Dying. Literal death, spiritual death. People are dying. And just because you don't hear about drive-by shootings a lot like we used to hear about them, they're still happening. People are still being killed. Young people are still dying. Black young men are still going to prison. You know, black men are still dying. And But we need to be able to tell people that God has need of you. He has need of you. You have to tell yourself that God has need of you. Yes, and see, yes. the enemy wants to make you think. I don't care what you've been through or what you've done in life. Sometimes it really, I mean, he really uh, uh, keeps painting that picture over and over and over in your head. But look what I did. Look what I've done. Uh, I, well, God will never forgive me. I've done this. I've done this. I went here. I've done this. I've done this. No, God has need of you. He told those disciples, he said, you tell them to loose them, loose the donkey and the, and the coat, loose them and let them go and tell them that the master has need of them. The master has need of them. Today, I want you to just tell yourself that the Lord has need of me. If you're yes. just sitting around, you don't know what to do. You try to figure it out, you're twiddling your thumbs. The Lord has need of me. Every gift you have, the Lord gave it to you. Every yes. talent yes. that you have. The Lord gave it to you. Yeah. And then you have to use it. You have to use it. I mean, you have to use it. And then you've got people that are be <laughs> what? You can't sing? Why are you, why are you trying to sing? Why are you trying to play? Well, because God gave it to me. I'm going to keep doing it until I perfect it. Whatever it is. Yeah. It's God that gave it to me, right? Yes. It's God that gave it to me. And if you let people, people will sit you down and shut your mouth. People will. If you allow people to just point the finger at you and tell you ain't hey, nothing. What do you think? Who you think you are? Well, you know what? I'm gonna tell you who I am. I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Hey, yes. That's who I am. I'm yes. tell you, that's who I am. I'm fearfully, fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. And God has need of me. Yeah. Everything about me, God can use me. And if it's not according to His will, God will fix you up and make you do things right. Mm -hmm. You know, He'll make you do it right. He'll make you do it right. He'll make you do it right. Mm -hmm. Paul thought he was doing things right. Paul did. He thought he was doing things right. You know, Amen. I'm going, are he killing folks? He's putting them in prison? You know, this is all for God. You ain't a Jew, I'm killing you. Whatever the case, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting you in a jail. I'm stopping by the, by the Romans and getting a letter. I'm going to make sure that I'm legal. When I come to your house and knock on the door and put you in prison, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it all in the name of God. Paul had his own, I mean, you know, hey, here he is. He, he got it going on, so he thought. On his way to Damascus to give, kill some saints, he had, a, he had an encounter with the God that he thought he knew. Oh. And God let him know that you really don't know me. I'm here for you. I, I, it's hard to kick against the prince. God gave him a revelation of who he was. And I, and I said that to say this, that although Paul thought he was doing things right, the Lord had need of Paul. Mm -hmm. He had need of Paul. Paul, right now, today, thousands of years, hundreds of years after his death, these letters are still alive, what Paul wrote. What Paul wrote. The letters from prison. I mean, the different things that Paul, the, the, the relationship that Paul had with Jesus. We still read about it. We still read about it. So, God has need of you. He can use you. And he wants to use you. And we're living in a time where people have to stand up and say, yes, for God I live. And for God, I die. Yeah. Because people are, they got all kinds of stuff out here that they believe in. All, and, it's all, and a lot of it is not God. But they get up boldly and say, this is who I am. This is what I believe in. Whatever the case. Jumping off a little bit. We, we, all of you that are in a voting age, it looks like the majority of you, a few of you might not be. I'm going to throw it out there. When it's time to vote, you need to vote. You need to vote. Vote. V-O-T-E. Vote. <laughs> you know who it was, what we're facing nowadays. We, we got some folks in that's trying to get into the White House that don't need to be in the White House. Mm -hmm. And if you don't voice your opinion, if you don't vote, 
Some of them might get there. One of them might get there, and I really don't want him to get there. <laughs> we don't want him to get there. But we also know that the Bible is going to be fulfilled. The, the word is going to be fulfilled. So I don't care who really gets in the office. Uh, the scriptures are going to be fulfilled. But I'm saying that we need to uh, take notice of what's happening in our world today. And when it comes time for voting, vote. When you have to speak up about something, speak up about it. I'm telling you, do it. The Lord has need of us. The Lord has need of you. The Lord has need of you. That, if I can, all I can say today is that the Lord has need of you. It's things that you can be doing. You can change a generation. You can change a person's life. You can change it. Just sometimes you can change it. You can change it. Have you ever been next to somebody and you wish you had to say something like something? Just tell you, say something to that person, or tell them, you know, to invite them to church, or uh, or say something to them. I I told you guys I think one time I was on college campus and I heard two girls coming my direction. They were talking loud enough, so I wasn't ear hustling as they say. <laughs> they were just talking loud enough, and they were telling each other, "I don't even go to church." It just I, I don't even go to church, and it was just as loud in my ears. I don't even go to church, and I just stood there and just. They'll just walk right on by. And that bothered me for the longest. Now, there was two people that I thought, you don't go to church. Here I am. Let me give you my address. You know? And I said, Lord, don't, I don't plan to do that again. I, I'll never do that again. And that was just, it was loud. I heard them. It wasn't like they was talking so loud, but it was like it was loud to me. And so um, we can't allow these kind of opportunities to pass us by. We need to just invite as many people as we can. Tell them about God. Sometimes you have to give people your own testimony. You do. You have to give people your own testimony. Because a lot of times people don't believe. We're living in a world now that even the ones that used to believe don't believe like they used to. And so we have to really let them know that God still heals. He still delivers. He still sets free. I was a smoker for years. Y'all know the story, but I was a smoker for years. And I don't need no weed smoker and no crack smoker. They say, oh, you were smoke one time. I said that. And he said, oh, that's why you were so skinny. I said, oh. <laughs> Let me straighten that up. <laughs> Back in the day, no, that wasn't the reason why I was so skinny. That was just in my DNA. <laughs> but I used to be a cigarette smoker. For a long time, I smoked. I mean, and as they say, I smoked religiously. I smoked. It was, it was boy, I tell you. And, and I felt like I had to smoke. You know, get finished eating, the cigarette, just cross my plate, just cigarette. Ooh. And when the Lord started dealing with me about smoking and start taking that away from me, the enemy would fight me in my dreams. In my dreams, I love the fish. I mean, I was on a big boat fishing. I was deep sea fishing. This is my dream. Boy, I was casting out, had a cigarette hanging. I was real. I'm talking about the enemy will fight you. <laughs> fight you. I was on a 10 speed bike going down Lotus Lane. Looked like I was going 50 miles an hour. That cigarette was up. I was smoking the cigarette. This was in my dream. But I'm talking about how the Lord has delivered you. You have to let people know yes. that, you know, God delivered me. And you might say, oh, that ain't no big deal. Say, yes, it is. People are dying from cigarettes. Yes. Dying from them. Dying from them. All kinds of stuff. Yes, Austin. Those commercials. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> they like, yeah. Oh, that's necessary. Yeah, they, some of them still smoking from the hole in the neck. Yeah. Ah, thank God he delivered me before the hole in the neck. You know what I'm saying? But just said different things that God delivered you from. You have to give your testimonies about so people will know. That I didn't do this on my own. I couldn't have done this on my own. I couldn't have done it on my own. My husband talks about being a heroin addict. You know? Looking at it, you wouldn't know that. You have to tell that testimony. Now, years ago, like I said, you couldn't have told me that, that was, I was going to be married to a heroin addict, an ex-heroin heroin addict. Me? Uh-uh. So... <laughs> God can clean you up. He has need of you, right? He has need of you. He has need of, need of you. Need of you. And the enemy want to make you think that you've done so bad, that you're so messed up, that you've been so many places, you've done the wrong thing. I mean, you know, that, that self-condemnation, that condemnation, yeah, condemnation. But the Bible lets us know that there is therefore now no condemnation. 
to them that walk after spirit and not after the flesh, right? Hmm. So we're walking after the spirit. So there's no condemnation. I don't get in the mirror and look at myself and talk about what I used to do all the time. If anything, I look in the mirror and say, boy, I'm glad I didn't stay there. You know? <laughs> right. Ooh, I'm glad I came out of there. Yeah. I'm glad I cut him off. <laughs> you know, I'm glad about that. But just as far as the self condemnation but that's what the enemy want to do. But no. If today, if nothing else, you tell yourself, you tell the enemy that God has need of me. Yes. He created me. He created you for a purpose. For a purpose. For a purpose. Because he could get every rock that you see on the side of a road and give it voice and make it praise him. But no, we're the ones that are here. Yes. And he said, let everything that has breath yes. praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. And so we are here for a purpose. And the Lord has need of us. He has need of us. He has need of us. He has need of us. And the people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. And that's what the world needs today. They need to be saved. They need to be saved. I'm talking about delivering, set free, save us. And so again, I'm saying that we have to be vocal and we have to let people know our testimony. Let people know that God delivered me, that he set me free, that he healed me from breast cancer. I'm, I'm, I'm a breast cancer survivor, too. And the enemy want to fight me this week, but I got my guard up. I'm fighting back, you know. I'll right, I have the test. I have the test. And I want to see when it come back uh, that it's negative, that I can just really smile at this doctor and let him know, okay, now you're still confused about it, okay? Just, you know, just be confused about it. That's what I want you to do is be confounded about it. And after this, I don't want a whole bunch of more tests. You do this and this is it. <laughs> now I'm done. <laughs> this is it. But you know what? I know God is God. is God, God is good. And, and as the doctor told me a few years back, when I went and I found out that I had breast cancer, he told me, he wouldn't say that it was God, but he said, somebody loves you. And I said, it's God. I know it was God. So because the kind of breast cancer I had, or whatever happened, however we found out we had it, it's usually not painful. And that's why a lot of times women, by the time they find out they have it, it's already a lump there. I didn't have all that. I just had one day, just went to work, and bam, just pain. And that was it. And he said, that was, that, that pain caused me to come to the doctor. Otherwise, they would have never seen it. Um, it was so deep, they wouldn't have seen it. But somebody loves you. <coughs> so today, I'm like, I know who somebody was, or that somebody is. I know that it was God, and God has need of me. He has need of me. Every gift he gave me, I want to use it for him. I want to use it for somebody, to bring somebody in. No, I'm not the best singer. But you know what? If I hit a key, I hit the right key, I'm going to sing that song. <laughs> By being the right key, I'm singing. <laughs> You know, so whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. Whatever it is, whatever your gift is, do it to the best of your ability. Like I told my friend, I said, there's only one you. Hmm. In the whole wide world, there's only one you. And when you're gone, nobody else can fill your spot. I'm just saying this to all of you now. When you're gone, nobody else can fill your spot. It's just one of you. Isn't that amazing when you just think about how God just created just one unique person? Like you, oh, you look like this person. Oh, you look just like this person. But it's, really, it's only just one you. Just one you. And whatever you're going to do in life, whatever you're going to do in Christ, you in, in this life and for Christ, you have to do it. You have to do it. All right, so I'm finished. God has need of you. Just remember that this week. Just remember that, that God yes. Has need for you. All right. God bless you. I hope you got something out of it. Showing even more jobs have been lost here in Bakersfield, this time in construction and mining. 23ABC looked into the cause and how some say it's related to oil. Inside these gates, you see rows of heavy construction equipment, bulldozers, diggers, water trucks, you name it. They've got just about everything you can think of. Just a few months ago, you wouldn't have seen all of this equipment sitting here in this yard. Employees say it was like a conveyor belt. When it's booming, there's a low bed trucks, there's two trucks, they're just hauling stuff out all the time and bringing stuff in. Today, you can see dried mud on tires in driver's seats sitting empty. Now it's just bring it in, 
fix it and then park it. And this is the story all across town. When drilling and pumping slowed, the equipment needed to service them now sits dormant. There's no drilling at all going on right now and uh, very little maintenance. Uh, it's bad. According to data released today by the California Labor Division, more than 3,000 jobs have been lost in Bakersfield from February 2015 to February this year. That was in construction, logging, and mining, something those in the industry say directly links to oil. Vice President of Gilliam and Sons said the oil side of their business is down 70 percent, leaving workers wondering what's next. The guys down the street that are all sitting at home, they look pretty down and out and depressed and worried for sure. says who? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. What Lord? Honor thy father and thy mother. Says who? Thou shalt not kill. Says who? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Well, who said that stuff? If you take out commandment number four, we don't even know who the author of the Ten Commandments is. God signs his name and puts his autograph in commandment number four. That's one of the reasons why it's so very, very important. Because it is commandment number four that identifies clearly the author of all ten commandments. One of the things that I love about Elder Cox's presentation is that he weaves history with biblical truth. That the Bible is thoroughly and solidly backed up by history. And we've learned a lot about that these last couple of presentations. And I'm sure we're going to hear more about that even this night. But if you would like to do some additional study, you can learn about the Sabbath in Russia, the Subotnik movement, the Sabbath in Africa, the Sabbath in India, the Sabbath even among the American Eskimo Indians, Sabbath in Ireland, Sabbath in England with the Seventh-day Men, Sabbath in France, Sabbath in Spain, Sabbath in the Piedmont Valley of, of, of uh, Europe, the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the Pasagini, the Cathari, all of these Sabbath-keeping groups. And you will be impressed to know that God has kept a people who have kept the Sabbath down through the ages, even though uh, the church and other organizations tried to stomp them out. God has taken care of the Sabbath, and God has taken care of the people who have taken care of the Sabbath. My name is C.A. Murray, and it is my privilege and pleasure once again to welcome you to Sally. What is the last sitting for this particular group of meetings as we study the Sabbath? Give me the Bible. And I think you can agree with me that God has been very, very dear, and we've learned quite a lot from Evangelist Cox during these last several meetings. I'm excited to hear what he has to say this night as we talk about how to keep the Sabbath holy. How are we going to keep the Sabbath? How do you flow into that blessing of keeping the Sabbath? And I'm anxious to hear our evangelist, our friend, our teacher, Evangelist Kenneth Cox, this night. Now, before he comes, we get to hear Donna Klein, minister in music. She's going to be playing an old spiritual, Joshua Fit the Battle. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Donna Klein. Appreciate that. You enjoy that? Yeah. Joshua, fifth the Battle of Jericho. Great, great song. Well, we welcome each of you. Happy to have you back here again this evening as we come to the last presentation on this question of the Sabbath. And we hope that it has helped you as we've gone through what the Scripture has to say. What says the Bible? The Blessed Bible, this should my only question be. God gave us the Sabbath to bless and remind us what says the book of God to me. That's what you and I need to look for. We need to find out what God's Word says to each one of us. So we hope you will continue to follow as we study God's Word together. Uh, our next series in May, in fact, the series in May and the one in June will be on prophecy. Our first one in, in May is entitled, Five Have Fallen. Five Have Fallen. And we're, we're looking at Revelation, the 17th chapter. And in the 17th chapter, verses 10 and 11, it says this, There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short time. So those are the five it's talking about that have fallen. Five have fallen. We're going to find out what those five are as we look at Bible prophecy. Important because it takes you step by step down through time, bringing us down to the time in which we live. And so uh, it's very important that you and I know those five that have fallen. But the text goes on and says in verse 11, the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth, is of the seven, and is going to perdition. And so that's what we'll look at in June uh, with the title of was, is not, and yet is. And we're going to tie all that prophecy together, which deals with our present time in which we're living. So we hope you'll be sure and follow as we go into these uh, two series on Bible prophecy. We hope it'll bless you in a special way as we take a look at it. As I mentioned, tonight we're talking about how to keep the Sabbath. How to keep the Sabbath. What are you looking for? What, how should I approach it? That's really what you need to understand is how should I approach keeping the Sabbath because you'll find two extremes concerning that. You'll find some people are fanatical and you can, we'll talk a little bit about that. You find others are totally liberal on it and uh, we need to see what God's Word says and how we are to keep the Sabbath and what He tells us about it. So we hope you'll be able to follow as we go through talk about it. It'll bless you in a special way. I hope you have enjoyed, those of you who have been watching by television, those of you that are listening by radio, and of course all of you that have been here, I hope you have enjoyed as much as I have having Joe Pearls here. Joe has really been a great, great blessing. We've enjoyed having him here so much, and I know that each of you, as you go about your activities, will be able to listen to his songs on uh, CDs and other ways that he puts them out, and we hope they'll bless you. Tonight he's going to do a song entitled, In His Hands. There are times I'm overwhelmed by the onset of trials And this burden that I carry It seems I've carried it for miles That's when I realize That in my faith alone I cannot stand And I know the time has come When I must put it in God's hands 
Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, first Lord, just to say thank you for being willing to make a way for each of us, being willing to come here and to pay a price that we might be saved. Lord, bless us tonight. We ask for your spirit to be present. Pray that our hearts may be open, that we may not take what we hear lightly, but that we might take it to heart and that we might realize that this is your words, your desire, and that we might bring our lives into conformity to your will and your desire. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, how does one keep the Sabbath and not be legalistic? That is one of the big issues is how you go about keeping the Sabbath and not be legalistic. And Christ 
faced this very much in his day and in his age because the Jewish people in Christ's day were very, very legalistic. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus. This is what he had to say. For I say to you, now he's speaking to the Jews, to the Pharisees and the scribes and so forth, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I said, unless your righteousness exceeds their righteousness, you're not going to make it in the kingdom of heaven. So there was something here, folks, different because you find that when the Jewish people came out of the captivity in Babylon, from that day on, they didn't worship idols anymore. You find that they kept the Sabbath. But yet he says that their righteousness was not what it should be, and they were extremely legalistic. Like if you go over to Jerusalem today, now I've gone there several times, and the Sabbath comes. You'll see signs like this saying, no smoking on the Sabbath. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, th this type of approach to the Sabbath. In fact, you go to the hotel, and they have what they call Sabbat elevators. And what does that mean? It means that the elevator runs all the time, and it goes floor to floor, stops, opens the door, and lets people on so you don't have to push a button. That's the purpose. To push a button, you would be breaking the Sabbath. Uh, the, the legalism that enters into that many, many times, folks, and the Lord said... That's not the kind of righteousness that he's looking for. That's not what he's wanting. And so he's asking you and I that our righteousness must exceed that righteousness or we won't make it into the kingdom of heaven. The difference lies between principles and rules. And until you understand the difference between principles and rules, you can't understand how it is to be kept, or what God expects of you and me. So what do we mean? What are we talking about when we're talking about principles? We're talking about rules. What makes the difference? Well, a rule is an absolute guideline that is to be carried out exactly the same way every time, regardless of circumstances. That's a rule. A rule is an absolute guideline. It has to be carried out the same way every time. It doesn't change. That's a rule. And don't misunderstand me. There has to be rules. There are certain things that you have to have rules for. But you must understand where they belong and how they fit. And you have to be very, very careful with them in your own life. Because if you don't, you'll wind up being legalistic. And Christ will not accept that. Whereas we talk about principles, a principle is a more general guideline that can adapt to changing circumstances. Unlike rules, principles are universal and allow for no special privileges. You see, rules allow for special privileges. For instance, if you and I drive down the highway at 90 miles an hour, we're going to be pulled over, and we're going to be given a ticket. Whereas a highway patrolman can drive down the highway at 90 miles an hour, and they won't pull him over. And see, that is the difference. There is... Uh, a privilege there. But with principles, there are no privileges. That applies to everybody. It's universal, but it's a more general guideline. It is not like a rule. This is where Jesus had all the trouble with the Pharisees and the scribes and so forth is because they were always, always quoting him rules. And they would quote him a rule and he would turn around and quote them a principle. 
and it would make them so mad at him that they would try and kill him. They didn't like him quoting principles to them when they had had a rule and he was not living according to their rule. Let me give you an example. Here in Matthew 12th chapter and verse 10, it says, And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Rule. Put it down. They said, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They believed it was not. That was a rule. You could not heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him. Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep? If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. So if you have a sheep and it falls in the ditch, you'll pull it out. How much more value then is a man than a sheep? Watch, principle, principle, therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. That was the principle. Christ said, it's not wrong to do good on the Sabbath. They believed it was. That was their rule. He's quoting a principle to them. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his ha- it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Now, he not only showed them the principle, he demonstrated it and healed the man. Watch what they did. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him that they might destroy him. They broke their rules. They just said, we, we can't stand him breaking the rule. So what you and I must do is make sure that we are operating according to principle, not by rule, when it comes to keeping the Sabbath. That is the difference that makes between being legalistic and not being legalistic, is I, if I govern my life by principle. Jesus gives you another example of this, and he said here, Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marveled. He, he did a, uh, healed somebody or did something, and they all marveled. Moses, therefore, gave you circumcision. Not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. Now, he said, you know, I healed somebody, and you're marveling and criticizing me because I healed somebody on the Sabbath, but you will circumcise somebody on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so, so that by the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? He said, here you circumcise somebody, but because I've made somebody well on the Sabbath, you're unhappy with me. Now watch. He comes to the point. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. You see, if you conduct your life by rules, then you're going to judge by appearance. You think about it. If you conduct your life by rules, you will judge by appearance. But if I run my life by principles, then you and I will judge based on righteous decisions, righteous judgment. That makes a great, great difference as to how I approach this question and what I do with it. You see, there's two extremes. It says that the Christian is to be in the middle of the road. Uh, The Bible refers to that as the narrow path. Some people misunderstand that. You know, they want, they want the narrow path to be fanaticism. No, the narrow path is in the middle of the road. That's where he wants us to be is in the middle of the road. On each side of the road are two ditches. And you don't belong in either one of them. I don't belong in one ditch or the other. One ditch is fanaticism. And if I'm fanatical about it, that's wrong. The other ditch is liberalism. Those are two different ditches. Fanaticism sets up all kinds of rules. I'm sure you've known people 
that are fanatic. And they set up all kinds of rules. And if you don't live by those rules, then like the Pharisees of old, they're after you. You know, they've got their checklist, and they're going to mark it off, and you have to do everything just this way. And there's lots, lots of people that were raised in Christian homes that their parents were fanatical, and they drove them away because their parents were fanatical. Uh, that's not what God wants us to be. I'm not to be in that ditch. Don't belong there. Also, then when it comes to liberalism, liberalism breaks the rules and treats the principles with disregard. Now, let me explain something. Christ did not go by the rules of the Pharisees, but he never, never, never violated principles. And you and I must never disregard principle. We must live our life by principle or else we will be breaking the Sabbath. Family, a farmer and his wife came home from church and uh, had eaten lunch or dinner that Sabbath. And they had just gone into the living room and sat down and picked up a book to read. And they were sitting there in the living room reading the book when this truck drove up in the front yard loaded with feed. And the wife looked at her husband and said, what's, what's that truck doing here? And her husband went out, and to her absolute amazement, he got in the truck and they drove down to the barn, and he helped the driver unload the truckload of feed. And when he came back in, she was livid. She said, you know better than that, that you shouldn't be unloading a truckload of feed on the Sabbath. She said, you know better than that. That's not right. You shouldn't do that. Husband said, I didn't break the Sabbath by unloading that truck of feed. I broke the Sabbath the other day when I ordered it and didn't tell him not to bring it out today. You see, there's a great, great principle that you and I need to understand that, you know, we, we put ourselves in positions that we should never be in. Uh, I don't belong in either side of the ditch, but I need to be Christian in what I do. I need to operate my life by principles. Okay, let's take a look, because as far as I'm concerned, this text here in Isaiah is one of the clearest there is in God's Word about how you and I should keep the Sabbath. Listen to it. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, you understand what that means? That means quit trotting it underfoot, treating it with disrespect. That's what it means. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing pleasure on my holy day, call the Sabbath of the light, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." fantastic text, folks. He just simply says, if you will do these things, I will bless you abundantly. That's what he's saying when he said, I'll cause you to ride on the high place of the earth, feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's a marvelous promise to you and to me. So let's look at different phases of that and see what he's talking about. The holy day of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him. The Sabbath is the Lord's day, the holy day of the Lord. It belongs to the Lord. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's his. It's his day. And it says that I am to honor him in keeping the Sabbath. How do I do that? Well, the Scripture tells you how I'm, you and I are to do that. 
It says, if you love me, what? Yeah, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If I'm going to honor him, then I need to keep his commandments. I cannot. I cannot say, I love you, and turn around and disregard his commandments. That's not sensible, folks. If he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so when we look at the Sabbath, it's one of the commandments, the fourth one. It says this, remember the Sabbath day to what? Keep it holy. Let's establish something. The only day that you and I can keep holy is one he made holy. You cannot keep a day holy he never made holy. You and I have no ability of ourselves to make something holy. We don't have that ability. God is the only one that has that, and he made the Sabbath holy, and he just says that you and I are to keep it holy. Okay. Six days you shall labor, do all your work. Clear, right? Six days you shall labor, do all your work. If you love me, keep my commandments. This is one of the commandments. He says, if you love me, do your work for six days. All right? But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. I remember when I first came across this. And I can remember this fellow that was studying with me. And, and he read this to me, you know. And so the next time he saw me, he said, what are you going to do about the Sabbath? And I said, well, I said, I'm going to keep every seventh day. And he said, well, good. I said, I'm going to keep every Sunday. And uh, he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? I said, that's every seventh day. I'm going to keep every seventh day, every Sunday. And he said, excuse me. He said, that didn't say a seventh day. It said the seventh seventh day great great difference folks he says clearly but the seventh day is the sabbath of the lord your god it's his sabbath not mine not yours it's his okay in it here he's telling you what you are to do what you're not to do in it you shall do no work you nor your son nor your daughter he said that day I have set aside, it's a day that you're not to work. And I'll talk more about this as we go on. Nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord God blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, made it holy. Now, some people say, well, Brother Cox... I can't keep the Sabbath. If I keep the Sabbath, uh, you know, I have to work on the Sabbath. I'm sorry, folks, but either he's God or he's not God. Either he's able of taking care of you or he's not able to take care of you. And if he tells you don't work on the Sabbath, then that's very simple. He takes responsibility for that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Anytime God ever asks you to do something and it costs you, God will repay. Let me say that again. Anytime God ever asks you to do something and it costs you, God will repay. Won't fail. Let me give you an example. It says here in Hebrews... He is what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You remember when Jesus was speaking to this crowd? And, and they, he was there at the Sea of Galilee, and they had backed him up and clear, till he was right at the water's edge. And, and he couldn't go back any farther, and they were so close to him that he couldn't speak to them. And so Peter was there, and he said, Peter, let me use your boat stepped in the boat, had Peter pull away from shore a little ways so he could see him, and he spoke to the people. When he finished, he told Peter, he said, put down your net. 
Now you've got to understand something. Peter said, Lord, we have just fished all night. Now, folks, the Sea of Galilee is clear. You can stand in a boat and look down and see the bottom of it. It's that clear. And I guarantee if you can stand there and see the fish, they can see you. Okay? And here he's fished all night long, has caught nothing. And here he's standing in the boat, looking down, and there's no fish anywhere. And he said, Lord, nevertheless at your word, we'll cast in the net. And they tossed in the net, and they caught so many fish, their nets wouldn't hold it. Now, do you know what Jesus was doing? He was just paying Peter for the use of his boat. See, God will repay. If it costs you, he will repay. Put it down. And so God says, don't work on the Sabbath. Dear friend, take him at what he says. Don't work on the Sabbath. And if you don't work on the Sabbath, he'll take care of you. And let me tell you something. Not very many things that I'll recommend to you about old age. But one thing it does, it gives you the ability to look back. And I can tell you over the years that I've done this and I look back, I have never seen a person to this day who stepped out in faith and said, I'll keep the Sabbath, that it cost them, that God didn't repay them. Never know of a case. God will honor you if you do it. Promises that. Well, let's go on. And shall honor him not doing your own ways. That just simply means that the Sabbath is not a day in which I go out and do what I want to do. It's not a day, I'm sorry, it's not a day that you go shopping. It's not a day in which you go to church, and when you get out of church, you go to the mall and go shopping. No, that's your own ways. God gave you six days to take care of that. It's His day, very clear. And He gives you an illustration in the Scripture showing how He feels about that. Because in Nehemiah's day, they had a problem with this. Listen. And in, this, and in those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine and grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens. In other words, he stood there and he watched the people as they're trading and shopping and going, doing all this on the Sabbath which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, and I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Nehemiah told them, stop this. Don't continue trading on the Sabbath. Men of Tyre dwelt there also who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, let me tell you something. There'll always be people around, folks, that are willing to sell you something on the Sabbath. That'll always be there, I can assure you. But God said, no, it's not a day in which you're to go shopping. It's not a day in which you're to buy things. Those are things that you need to take care of some other time. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? He said, why, why are you doing this? Why are you breaking the Sabbath? Now watch what he says to them, folks, because it's important. Because people say, oh, it doesn't make any difference. Let me tell you something. It does make a difference. It makes a very, very strong difference. You see what Nehemiah says to them as a result of their violating the Sabbath. Did not your fathers do this? He said, didn't your forefathers do this? And did not our God bring all this, what? Disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath? He said, your forefathers, 
they did this, they didn't keep the Sabbath, and we're suffering from this today. And now you're going to turn around and do the same thing? And, and folks, all you got to do is go back and look, and you can see clearly those who follow the Lord, those who walk with Him, those who keep His Sabbath, those who obey what He says, He blesses. Sorry, He does. And when I'm saying keeping the Sabbath, I'm talking about not just being fanatical about it, but I'm talking about following what the Scripture says. So it was at the gates of Jerusalem as it began to be dark before the Sabbath. This meant it was getting dark on Friday evening. Sabbath was beginning. Before the Sabbath, that I commanded the gates to be shut, and I charged that they must not be open till after the Sabbath. He said, shut the gates. Why did he have to do that? Why did he have to shut the gates? He had to shut the gates because there's some people that will never, never, never listen. I mean, you can tell them in clear, certain terms, and they're still going to go contrary to what Scripture says. Then I, po then I posted some of my servants at the gates so that no burden might be brought in on the Sabbath. He just didn't even shut the gates. He put some people there guarding it. Now the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of wares who did what? Lodge outside of Jerusalem once or twice. They, they came there Friday evening and they found the gate shut and so they stayed all night hoping they'd get in. Then I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do it again, I'll lay hands on you. And from that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. He said, stop it. If you don't, I'll lay hands on you. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. So it's clear the Sabbath is not a day, folks, that I go shopping. It's not a day that I do things that I want to do. The Sabbath is the Lord's. It belongs to Him. It's not mine. I must give it to Him. I must honor Him in that. But it also says, and shall honor Him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own what? Pleasure, nor speaking your own words. What does that mean? That has to do with entertainment. It's not a day in which I just have entertainment. It's not a day that I'm going to go out and just, you know, go somewhere. I, I find people think that the Sabbath is a day that they can just go out and, you know, do their own pleasure on that day. Entertainment. No, it's not, that's not what it is. It says not finding your own pleasure. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean by that that it's to be a day, particularly where children are involved, where they're told you sit down there and you stay there. You know, that, that's not what it should be. The Sabbath should be a time that the children enjoy. And as parents, by the way, it is your responsibility to see that they do. You can't, you can't just take a child and set them in a chair and expect them to enjoy it, you know? They don't. You have to do something with them. But, dear friends, we can do things with the children that they love. I still, some of the fondest memories I have is Friday night, Sabbath evening, with my children. Because we'd, if we weren't in a meeting or something, come home and have something to eat on Friday evening and after we'd eaten something, sitting down in the floor uh, with the kids there and just reading or singing songs with them and just doing something as a family. Uh, some of the 
best memories I have is doing that. It's not a day that I'm to do my pleasure. It might be Sabbath after church. I certainly wouldn't be wrong to take the children for a walk. But it doesn't mean that I'm go play baseball. See? And by the way, dear friend, it also isn't a time in which I turn on the television set and watch some movie. That's not keeping the Sabbath. That's doing your own pleasure. That's not what it is. It's his day. It's not my day. It's his day, and I need to keep it and in a way that will bless me and my family and that God would be pleased with. It's not a time where I just go do my own thing. Then what's going to happen? Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. That's how you delight yourself in the Lord. Okay, let's talk about resting in Christ. One, says the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. In other words, what it's saying here is the Sabbath is a time in which I am to rest physically. They rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. God set that day aside and said that it is a day in which you and I should rest physically. That is part of Sabbath keeping is to stop your work and rest on the Sabbath. Okay. Secondly, it has something else to do. You remember the sisters, Mary and Martha. It says, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was distracted with much what? Serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken from her. It means to rest means that I must also learn to rest spiritually. I need to learn to rest spiritually. So, how do I do that? I'm going to read to you Hebrews, the fourth chapter far as I'm concerned, it gives to you a lot of counsel about learning to rest in Christ. Therefore, since a promise remains to enter what? His rest. Let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, in those who heard it. Okay, didn't profit them anything. For we who have what? Believe do enter that rest. In other words, it's talking about you and I entering into the rest with Christ Jesus. We believe we enter into that rest. What does that mean? That means that I rest in confidence in Him that I say here, And I surrender my life and say, yes, Lord, I rest in you. All right? So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works which were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day. Listen carefully. Of the seventh day in this wise, and God rested on the seventh day from all his what? Works. Okay. And again in this place, They shall not enter my rest, since therefore remains that some must what? Enter it. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. They didn't enter into God's rest. They were legalistic, but they didn't enter in because of disobedience. Again, he designated a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it has been said, Today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them what? Rest. Then, we not, then he would ha- not have spoken, uh, excuse me, then he would not afterwards have spoken another day. Joshua could not give them rest. 
He took them into the land of Canaan. That's not the kind of rest. There remains, therefore, what? A rest for the people of God. Now, folks, that's the way it reads in English. If you want to read it how it says it actually in Aramaic, which is the language Jesus spoke, it says there remains a keeping of the Sabbath to the people of God. That's what that text says in Aramaic. There remains a keeping of the Sabbath to the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Okay, how do I rest? Let me just quickly tell you how to rest. One, have the right attitude. I'm sorry, I have been in situations in home where women have worked all day Friday, getting the house all cleaned and everything right and everything, and so that it was all done for the Sabbath. And when, the sa when Friday was over and the Sabbath begun, they were so out of sorts that nobody could live with them. That is not Sabbath keeping. It's not what God means. My attitude needs to be right. It's more important that my attitude is right rather than something is clean. Therefore, make sure as you go into the Sabbath that your attitude is right. If you get up Sabbath morning and you're out of sorts, get back in bed and get out on the other side and get right. But you don't need to be having a bad attitude. That's not good Sabbath keeping. Secondly, confession. Confess your sins. Don't go into the Sabbath carrying a great big load of sins on your back. God doesn't want you to do that. You need to get rid of that. Just confess them and get rid of them. It says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Secondly, rest from sin. What do I mean by that? When you get up, Sabbath morning, dedicate your life to God. Give your life to Him. Give Him that day in a special way. Let it be His day. Let Him have it. Don't, you know, don't go on continuing to disobey God. Rest from sin. Stop sinning. Stop disobeying the Lord. Rest from making a living. Six days you should work. Do all your work. You don't need to work on the seventh. That is God's day. Stop making a living and rest in the Lord. Understand, folks, why God gave the Sabbath. God gave the Sabbath because you and I need to rest. The only way I can be saved is I must rest in what Jesus Christ did for me. I can't do anything to be saved. All I can do is accept what Jesus did. So the Sabbath is to teach me that every week, that I'm to rest in Christ. I'm to rest in what He has done for me. That is how I'm to keep the Sabbath. So I need to rest from making a living. I need to stop work. Also, I need to rest from the bombardment of life. Get away. Get away from all the noise, all the bombardment. Turn that TV off and leave it off, you know, over the Sabbath. You don't need that going on. I never understood. I wouldn't let somebody in my house use some languages and teach my children things and live in my house. You know, I wouldn't have somebody come to my house and live in my house that would teach my kids things were wrong. But I'll put a TV in there and let them listen to all that junk, and that's okay. No, that's not okay. Don't get away from the bombardment of life. Learn to rest in Christ. As he simply said here, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. God wants you to grow in grace. God wants you to day by day come closer to Him, to learn of His love, to learn of His goodness, 
to learn all that he wants to do for you and simply for you to rest rest in what he has done for you if you will do that god will bless you every day will grow sweeter and sweeter and sweeter as you walk with the lord i hope that you will enjoy all the wonderful things that god has for you on the sabbath jesus said in luke chapter 8 a sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed some fell by the wayside and it was trampled down and the birds of the air devoured it some fell on rock and as soon as it sprang up it withered because it lacked moisture and some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it but others fell on good ground sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold Jesus Christ came to sow the seed of truth into this world and just as every seed has life in it the Word of God is also life Jesus said in John 6:63, 6, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. But sadly in this day and age, many professed ministers of the gospel don't accept the Bible as God's inspired word because its plain teachings condemn their practices. They have tried to make it appear mysterious and obscure in order to excuse their own transgressions of God's law. There are those who try to make everything seem pleasant and positive. They gloss over or ignore the warnings of God, and thus they strip the Bible of the power to convict sinners of their need of salvation. But no matter how brilliant and how pleasant they sound, their message cannot satisfy the spiritual hunger of a true seeker. The truth is that ever since the fall of man, Satan has been busy sowing the seed of error. But friends, when the Word of God is preached in simplicity and sincerity, it's powerful. Instead of pointing out the errors of others or seeking to combat the opponents of the gospel, we must follow the example of Christ and simply sow the seeds of truth. Oh yes, there will be seeds that will fall by the wayside, be eaten by the birds, other seed will sprout in stony soil, only to dry up for the lack of water. Still others will fall among the thorns, but many will spring up to bear an abundant fruit. The sower's job is to sow seed, and believe me, there is no greater joy than to see the lives transformed under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It's an experience all of us can have. And it's the only goal we have as a ministry team. We have a marvelous opportunity to sow by broadcasting these wonderful seeds of life to the whole world. Jesus gave all of us the Gospel Commission. Won't you join us in this effort? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, you may send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us to bring the blessed hope to millions all around the world. annual Isabella Lake Fishing Derby got underway this morning, bringing thousands of people to the water. 23BC's Brandon Johansson spoke with a group who's focused on teaching people how to enjoy the area responsibly. Gracia, higher water levels have a ton of people heading out to enjoy the derby, and in an effort to keep the lake clean, a national organization was brought in to educate anglers and their families on outdoor ethics. The annual fishing derby is back this weekend at Isabella Lake. We probably have at least 5,000 people around the lake. After the recent drought kept water levels low at Isabella Lake, this year's snowpack has them on the rise, just in time for the derby. We have ample water in the lake, 
where we planted 9,000 pounds of fish. And thanks to El Nino, you can see uh, the water levels risen really drastically over the last few days. We seem to be gaining about four vertical inches a day right now. Water levels were so low in recent years that Michael Sullivan had to close down his marina in 2014. But now the marina is back and local tourism is likely to follow. A lot of our tourism that comes up here for the fishing, the bass tournaments, uh, the rafting, is, it, it's just been you know, very slow for the last four years. So to get this kind of a snowpack, it's going to help everyone in this whole community. It's, it's really what we needed. With large numbers streaming back to the lake, an international organization called Leave No Trace was brought in to teach the public how to enjoy the lake while keeping the area clean. It, it's a big deal. Um, Leave No Trace is a national organization, even somewhat international. Their training curriculum can be found with federal agencies, state agencies. And our mission is simply to teach people how to enjoy the outdoors responsibly. Jenna and Sam serve as traveling trainers, heading up and down the western part of the U.S. to educate people about keeping high-impact areas clean, areas like Isabella Lake and Kern River. It's areas that are we call being loved to death. You know, we have a lot of people coming to these areas. They're excited to be there. And then with that, we tend to see impact. During their eight-day stay, they hope to ignite a fire in the community that will have them practicing Leave No Trace philosophies long after they leave town. We love the area. It's a beautiful place, and, it, and it's a place worth protecting. Oh, yeah. And the Derby will continue through the weekend and will wrap up on Monday at 5. If you'd like to learn more about Leave No Trace and what they're doing, head to the 23ABC app. In studio, Brandon Johansson, 23ABC. All right, because his presence is in this place. Amen. I feel it. Yes. I know it's here. Yes. I feel better. I thank God because of your testimonies. Uh, they encouraged me today. I gave you a prayer request that I wanted you to pray for me this week. And the enemy fights even leaders, you know, mm -hmm. really fight you. And I, I'm yeah. the one that I'm transparent. I got to let you know, you know, I'm having a struggle with this test that's coming up. But I know that God is, is, is the God of tests. <laughs> He's, he's a God that can deliver. He's a God that can set free. And I just I just appreciate your testimony this morning that encouraged me. Brother Dwight, you talked about praising God before you even get the blessing. And I thought that was all good. Brother David talked about the testimony. He does this praising God because if you have your, your breath, whether it's raining, uh, if it's snowing, if it's sleeting, whatever the case, it's a good day. We can Amen. praise God. And so I just yes. praise God for um, his mercy. I don't plan to leave you for you long. And thank you. Uh, yeah. Brother Malik for being here with us. And it's just, just a blessing. We've had a good time since Sunday school Amen. this morning. Yes, I mean, the yes. Sunday school lesson was good. It was talking about struggling faith. And um, yeah. I, I thought maybe I would even piggyback on that. Even earlier this week, I just thought about it. I just loved the title that, The Struggling Faith. And it was just talking about Peter. And David already talked about it. But just talking about how his faith was struggling. He loved God. He, he was with him. And, and he believed him. He, he thought he did. He, you know, he come to find out his faith was struggling. And God knew who he was. He uh, knew uh, about Peter more than Peter knew about himself. And so I just thank God this morning that he's a God that understands us. That yes. when our faith struggles, you know, when we, when we get a little bit weary, God is still God and he encourages us. And so I just praise him this morning. Uh, we have a visitor this morning. Uh, but Kenny feels I was, she didn't uh, ask you to speak, but I thought if you have anything you'd like to say, we're glad to have you in our midst this morning. Uh, Kenny, would you like to have something to say? I'm glad to be here. Amen. Stand up. <laughs> glad to be here with you guys. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. I'm glad he's here too. Uh, and Kenny, I mean, this is his first time being here, I know, but he came in, he was listening to the music, he started singing the songs, and that's how we started out with How Great Is Our God. And Malik was singing it, but, I mean, he was playing it, but then Kenny started singing it. So, Kenny, we're glad that you're here um, this morning with us. And so, if you would, just turn with me to the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 21. As we approach uh, Easter, this is the season of uh, Easter. You're going to be seeing a whole bunch of Easter eggs, chocolate bunnies, bunny suits. You, you, you name it, you're going to be seeing it. Green eggs, blue eggs. We might have some blue eggs or something like that. We might, but it don't have anything to do with the Easter bunny. 
not going to have anything to do with the Easter Bunny. But um, anyway, this is in regards to um, celebration of Easter, Resurrection Sunday. We we are, we are alive today because Christ Christ is alive, <laughs> and He's alive in us. And so, uh, chapter twenty one of Matthew, you have it, verse one, and we'll read together. All right, you have it. All right, it says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go to the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, Ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a great, a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed, crying, said, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Father, we just thank you this morning for your goodness and your mercy, your kindness, your grace. We thank you, O oh God, for how you bless each one of us to be here today, how we have a reasonable portion of our health and strength. We just thank you, O oh God, for the mindset to give you praise and to give you honor. And we just thank you for the things that you've done for us and the things that you're going to do. We just thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for everybody that's here. I ask, oh God, that you would word of my mouth and give me what to say. Nothing more, nothing less. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to take for a topic today. I believe I'm going to take it out of the third verse. And it says, If any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, the Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send you. So today my topic would be, the Lord has need of you. The Lord has need of you. Or in other words, say, the Lord has need of me. Just tell yourself, the Lord has need of me. And we hear people say a lot of times, well, the Lord don't need you. The Lord don't need you. But we know that, you know, he could call a thousand angels, or he, the, the rocks could cry out. We, we know that. But... He placed us here on planet Earth, so he has need of us, right? He has need of us. So it talks about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, it says, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and they were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them. And bring them unto me. And I don't know all the details. I really haven't had a chance to just go deep off into this scripture. I've had it preached several times. But as I was just thinking in my mind, Jesus knows all things. Know everything about us. It ties into the Sunday school lesson today when Peter thought he knew himself better than Jesus knew him. And Peter said, you know, you can, everybody else around you is going to deny you. But I'm not going to deny you. You know, they can do what they want to do. I'm not going to deny you. But Jesus knew all things, and for him to send out two disciples, and he said, go into the village Bethphage, over against the Mount of Olives, so you're going to find an ass and a colt, you're going to have to find them tied. He knew that they were tied up, and I was thinking this morning, I said, I don't know what's going on in your life, I don't know what's got you tied up today, I don't know, maybe it's some things that's got you tied up in life, but God has need of you. Yes. He has need of you. And, and people might push you to the side and think you, 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 you're not that much. You know, I don't know. You, 
It was just a donkey. Well, they said it was an ass. It was a donkey. So I ain't cussing y'all. It was a donkey. It was an ass. People might think nothing much about you. But it's not what people think about you. It's really what God thinks about you. Right? It's, it's really what the Lord thinks about you. He said, I know that there's a donkey, there's an ass, and there's a colt tied in the city. And I want you to loose them. And if any man asks you, what you want 